All right, welcome to the very first Heart Tree Livermore Joint Webinar on Computational Science. We are going to call this series HLCS Webinar. Uh, this series is supported by the HPCIC, High Performance Computing Innovation Center at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and STFC, Science and Technology Facilities Council Heart Tree Center at UK. This webinar will be a great venue for you if you're looking for industrial uh, collaboration. Um, we will meet once a month and no registration is necessary. So please take advantage of this webinar series and uh, spread the words. All right, before we introduce our uh, very first speakers, uh, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A section at the end. Second, today's HLCS seminar is open to external audiences. Uh, therefore, no classified discussion is allowed. So please watch out. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now, let me introduce our speakers today. It is an honor to host two speakers from Heart Tree Center today. Um, the, the first speaker is Michael Gleaves, who is a deputy director of the Heart Tree Center based on the SIDEC uh, Dersbury Ders campus, uh, which was created to deliver competitive advantage through applied research and innovation projects with UK industry to accelerate the adoption of transformative computational technologies such as high performance computing, data analytics, AI, and quantum technologies. Prior to working at the Hartree Center, Michael was project lead for data and metadata capture systems for STFC, large facilities, and held positions in area of research, development, and sales at Unilever and Dionex, now Thermo Fisher Scientific. Okay, the second speaker is Basil Alexandrov, uh, is, who is the Chief Science uh, Officer of Heart Tree Center, uh, SciTech in Dersbury, uh, since March 2019. His key expertise is in computational science, scalable, fault-tolerant, and resilient algorithms, including Monte Carlo methods for advanced computer architectures, he leads um, STFC's collaboration with UKAEA based at Heart Tree Center and co-leads by Dr. Rob Akers. He leads the ECP UK Exascale Computing Initiative, uh, working collaboratively with ECP project at USA. He co-chairs the workshop in latest advances in scalable algorithms for large scale systems as supercomputing, uh, from 2010 to 2020, 22, uh, Basil has worked and is collaborating closely with uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab over the past 23 years in uh, several areas. Before coming to Hartree, he was an ICREA research professor at uh, BSC in the Spain, 2010 to 2019, distinguished visiting professor at Mon Monterey, Monterey Tech, and Professor in Computational Science and uh, the Director of the ASAT Center at the University of Reading in UK. Today, um, uh, the Michael will start first and he will talk about industrial engagement at the Hartree Center and Barcio uh, will follow and talk about Hartree Center research focus and highlights. Now, without further ado, uh, let me pass the button to Michael. Thank you for that fantastic introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here today to, to talk to you. So I've got the job of really, I'm, I'm assuming no knowledge. So I'm going to introduce the Hartree Center and the work we do um, from the ground up, a, a little bit about how we engage. And we um, recently got a five-year program um, called the Hartree Center, National Center for Digital Innovations, which I'll talk a little bit about um, as, as 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 an overview and hopefully that'll give you a a perspective of how we've approached both um applied research and innovation in the hpc and um, data analytics ai space but also the engagement with industry so 
All good heart tree presentations start with who the hell was Douglas Rayner heart tree. So um, this guy was a mathematician and scientist and a, and a sort of conto contemporary of Alan Turing um, Center. He actually visited MIT in probably the 1930s and saw one of these analog um, um, computers, a differential analyzer, as they were called at the, at the time. Um, and he then came home and started to build one out of Meccano. Um, the one in the picture on the right was um, one that was custom built for him in Manchester University. But what really interests us about Douglas Rayner Hartree and the reason we named the center after him was given his real understanding of mathematics, math mathematics and he, he could analyze, he was a um, partial and differential an uh, an uh, um, uh, mathematician. He took a really applied approach to um, solving industrial problems, um, particularly with um, government and industry. And he, he, he tackled over 200 problems within, within, his, within his lifetime. Um, so th um, things associated with the war office, the Hartree Fock calculation, which is used within um, um, chemical calculations today to, to, to look at um, electron density. But most interestingly to me is he worked with Lions Tea and Biscuits, which was a large company in the 40s, and built their first ERP systems to 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 um, analyze the flow of money and resources through through their organization. So really it's a, a fundamental understanding of maths. He was one of the first real coders to be able to, to implement that that mathemat mathematicians onto a, what was a supercomputer of its day. And then the real applied focus was that he was able to achieve such a significant uh, amount of activity in, in his time. The one thing he wasn't particularly good at was um, quotes. Um, so the Hartree Centre, leading from Douglas Rayner Hartree's activity, was really to take the spirit uh, of, of Douglas Rayner Hartree and apply that to, to UK industry. So our mission is to transform UK industry by accelerating the adoption of high performance computing, and that means uh, high resolution modeling and simulation, big data and AI technologies. Um, we were set up in the 1st of February, 2013, um, and have been operating um, since, since then. We've carried out over 500 projects with UK industry, um, and we've basically codified that into four specific offerings. So the most popular is collaborative R&D. Um, so this is where you, uh, the company comes and they don't need to know anything about really the underlying maths or computation, uh, computational methods. They, they bring with, a, with them um, potential problems um, or jobs to be done, as I like to be called them, that we can then sift into, into projects that could be solved by modeling and simulation, data analytics or, or, or AI. Um, some organizations have access, you know, access to the, all the, all the um, computational skills they need and really what they want to run is the, the larger jobs. Um, so we also offer a platform as a service where we will build software um, tools on platforms and they will just run through, through, through either command line or through a interface that we built onto, onto the machine. Um, Creating digital assets um, is really software applications that we work with um, a co-located team of IBM researchers that are on this site. And I'll talk more about how we approach that within uh, later in the talk within HNCDI, where we co-create with IBM Research and, um, and, and the company software and digital assets that, that can be um, used as a basis for future collaborative R&D or platform as a service, or can be adopted directly into the industry partner in a way that can uh, um, deliver competitive advantage. And then finally, training and skills. So um, we've transitioned recently due to the uh, COVID pandemic from delivering face-to-face -to, -face to an online tr training platforms, uh, where we're trying to upskill people, particularly in domain expertise and um, later life education, continuous professional development, where we think there's a gap in the market within the UK. So really, you know, this isn't a program you can do on your own. We end up being as a network of expertise. We have good collaborative partnerships with the University of Liverpool and Vassal is there today 
and we have an embedded department called the Virtual Engineering Centre, which is within our, our, our centre. We, we have collaborative partnerships with IBM, Siemens, NVIDIA, Atos and Intel to, to, to try and give us the technology, but we're trying to maintain some independence within the technology that we use and focus on the industrial requirements. We also have links into local business networks around uh, industry four applications, which is are quite large, and the campus of companies of 150 companies were based here on our site. And we try and represent into uh, central government and, um, and and local government some of the future needs for technology to uh, align funding across government, industrial, and, um, and in innovation sectors needs. So. Vassal will cover a little bit more detail, the sort of technical detail, but I'll give you some case studies of the types of applications that we've solved in the time. If you are interested in these work, there's over 60 uh, case studies that you can find by putting Hartree case studies into your favorite um, search engine, but they also give you a flavor of our approach to the work. So a significant amount of our work, we've done a number of projects with Unilever and they're a great collaborative partner. But a good example of how we've changed the way that they approach is the area of computer aid formulation. So this is really o overturning um, over 100 years of, uh, of, of mindset around how Unilever developed products into, into the marketplace. When we first started working with them, they were very um, physical, physical and experimentally driven. So you'd have an idea within your office and you would take that idea straight to the lab, you'd create um, samples, those samples would go to a central analytical department, they would be analysed, returned to you, and you would start that cycle again, iteratively trying to improve the formulation of the product to give better performance or, 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 a, or a more sustainable formulation, which drives a lot of their business. Um, they, they asked us whether we could build a digital um, formulation methodology that would help them understand how you produce the soft, creamy feel that customers like um, using the microstructure of these materials from the salt fact and, um, and, and water that was used to make them up. And we've been working closely with Unilever to codify a computer-aided formulation simulation which allows them to formulate the products, particularly in home care and personal care, to help them drive a digital first innovation model where we don't remove the laboratory. They have to go from idea to digital. Once they have a good understanding of the area they want to explore physically, they then take that innovation into the laboratory in order to shorten the time to produce um, material, uh, um, new, new products and services. In the sort of data analytics and AI space, we've been working with um, um, a company called Waitmans, which is a large legal firm, which are carrying out um, um, significant amounts of insurance claims associated with car and industrial accidents. And one of the problems they were um, trying to address within the business was how do you redact documents? So. Um, Mr. Brown had brown hair, is you want to redact the Mr. Brown and not the brown hair, hair mechanism. So using our knowledge of natural language processing and an ability uh, and access to the data files from, um, from the, this, this organization, we built a pipeline for automatic um, redaction of legal documents, particularly for industrial injuries. Um, and we, um, we were able to demonstrate that that was as successful as the um, the, the legal impact, legal legal people who were, were doing that work. Obviously, it's not very uh, exciting work redaction of documents, and that that has a significance. We've now licensed that. We're looking to license that to a, a technology provider who works closely with Waitmans, and that will be then adopted into the existing workflow um, within within the organisation. And then. Um, another couple of examples is that uh, we, we work closely with Rolls-Royce and this is much more on a HPC side where we gain access to the underlying um, software that Rolls-Royce use in order to, um, to, to, to calculate the, the, the computational fluid dynamics within the, the wings, but also the acoustics side of, side of that activity. 
and by um, working and modifying the codes using your HPC optimization techniques, we, we've been able to move that between 20% and, and, and increasingly 40% faster um, than the, the current system is, is there today, which is work that you would recognize to, to today within Lawrence Livermore. Rolls-Royce have this um, ambition to run whole engine simulations, and that requires a significant increase in the um, in the optimization complexity and scalability of those codes. But there are really good examples of where um, petascale and exascale HPC systems can 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 give real um, um, competitive advantage, but also um, um, economic and social benefits. And then finally, working with SMEs, this is a company called BAC Mono, um, where where they hadn't really, this is a formula, well, there are a set of engineers who make this um, tremendous um, track-based car that's also drivable with on, on, the, on the road. So the idea is you drive it on the road, have your days fun on the track, and then, and then drive home. So these engineers are traditional Formula One uh, engineers, but they, 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 they were very, um, paper-based and CAD-based um, um, drawings, and they uh, engaged with us through an SME program in order to um, look at how fluid dynamics works over the surface of the car, and particularly on on the on the, uh, um, the downforce uh, on the on the on the bottom of the vehicle. This is the first time that they put CFD across across their their, their CAD, and we actually placed this system into a virtual reality system within the types of headsets that you can. You can buy in the in the, in the the, the um, your 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 shops, and that what wasn't was a bit discombobulating for the uh, for the scientists. So we then um, got one of our technicians to put this in um, a reality engine, which is the, the 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 games engine which is used for Fortnite, and this is the example that we then projected onto a screen. So you can see the fluid dynamics across the surface. The great thing about doing this is that you can then bring the, the scientists and the engineers into the organization. They can have a group discussion around whether this is how they expected and how they designed it to be. Um, and and, and that this has led to um, this company um, employing um, engineers to, to, to typically look at this type of CFD engineering and how it can be applied within their business. So we'll talk a little bit more now about um, our, our Big program for the National Centre for Digital Innovations. This is a five-year program across the UK, which was funded last year, and we're working towards that now. Um, so, I think that um, most nations across the globe are, are interested how you know artificial intelligence and data analytics as a general-purpose technology uh, and activity that. Um, that, that can be embedded within organizations. Um, and through, through the Hartree Center, we've seen there's a numbers of barriers to adoption. And what we're looking at are, are the, where are the barriers to adoption for digital technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, that can improve the productivity, innovation, and economic growth of, of, of companies that engage. So um, we were lucky enough to get um, 172 million pounds of government investments, which is co-invested by 38 million pounds of in-kind from, from IBM Research. And we've set out this program of work, and I'm briefly gonna go through, through this at a high level and then focus a little bit more on the top, top layer. So our data center was aging, so we're putting a new energy efficient data center into, into the site which will allow, enable us to um, scale those those bigger computing platforms. And once that building is built, we've got HPC data platform and a private cloud that will that will be embedded within that within that system, which is how we are looking at, at the digital um, engagement of, 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 of the, the systems. And then the barriers to adoption of these top line of, of areas. So explain is our training program, explore, there's 104 projects which are proof of concepts, which are to try and get to a stage gate with a company as quickly as possible to show that this technology has value. Accelerate is a slightly larger program, which is um, 32 projects where we are trying to look at the software engineering integration of that tool within to your organization so it can, can be rapidly adoptable, um, but stop at the actual adoption phase. And then emerging technology, where we're looking at um, a new paradigm of quantum computing, and where that will 
um, apply in our industrial engagement. Skip through that. So if I talk a little bit more about the uh, program around explain, um, so this is a, a, a select, we are looking at training 5,000 mid-career scientists. So these are typically people who have entered into the workplace um, and have grained uh, engineering or scientific or pharmaceutical or healthcare te te uh, technical expertise and are interested in layering on um, cloud, artificial intelligence, um, data analytics, and modeling and simulation skills in order to be able to adopt the innovations that we are creating in our program. Um, the reason we've looked at this mid-career um, angle is we think there is a significant short um, um, gap in the market within the UK for, for, for those areas, particularly where they are supported by um, technicians. So there's lots and lots of um, um, online courses that you can find in this area. But if you get stuck having access to, 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 to real um, project scientists and, and professionals, that can help you understand this and apply the, that that technique into your business has, has, has been really interesting. Um, and we've got a lot of good feedback that that, that is driving a lot of um, value to, to these organizations. Um, we have, um, we've, we, we've started from the ground up. So introductory means that you, and with learning pathways through areas around cloud or AI or, uh, um, 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 modeling and simulation introductory assumes that you have no knowledge at all so so you can anybody can enter into into those systems we are then trying to put, um, um, translate that into learner and independent learner um, activities where where you have hands-on expertise of using these tools and you can then take those tools into your area of work with the final stage being to try and get people to practitioner levels where they, they're confident that they can become a self-learner and independent within within the workplace and, and go on their own self-learning journey around these 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 technologies. So we've built these pipelines th through through the work. These are available on the website now, and I just pulled um, the next four or five for, from our website to give you an idea of how we're how we're sort of representing them to the to to the market. These are free at the points of use, and you know beginner to AI and the ability to scope and model requirements, and advanced data science. You can you can you can read these yourselves. So I talked a little bit about explore and accelerate, and then I'll hand over to um, um, Vassal to to talk a little bit more in depth around our research program. Um, <clears throat> So this is the work we've done with um, um, IBM Research. So where we are looking to solve um, complex um, economic and societal problems where there isn't off the shelf solutions. These are scoped as nine month um, two person projects um, where we've got a clear endpoint. So at the end of that nine months, we can say, does this work or does this not? Um, if that if that is successful, we'll then go to the company and ask them whether they want to translate into accelerate, which leads to um, an adoptable solution. Obviously, the the AI is a big area, so we've tried to to um, have strategic areas of focus. So AI enhanced modeling and simulation. So combining artificial intelligence, whether that's a Bayesian optimization at the front of a simulation, in order to select the next best. Um, calculations or using AI to process the outputs of simulation in a way that um, can give you insight. AI enhanced data analytics, which is workflows of uh, machine learning and data analytics. And we've done some significant work in microbiome and healthcare in this space. Scalable AI, which is really um, the, um, the the activity that, that Vassal will talk about. And hybrid computing and the computing continuum. We're seeing within the UK that there's a significant move to the adoption of these technologies through cloud and hybrid cloud. And we're looking to translate containerized tools into those environments that give them an, a more adoptable area. Um, and we split these down into two areas. So this is the TRL levels that you've seen, and I've taken a, um, 
a, a, a machine learning and model um, and TRL version that was from a conference um, in 2019 to, 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 to describe where we're looking for these capability and application build projects, but we're, we're looking for the engagement of the industry partner on both a technical and executive level. And we find that that relationship allows us to move these things forward um, into a position where we can go back to the, to, to the, to the business and ask, is this technically viable and is it, is it businessly viable? So a big area of what we're trying to do is to reimagine the scientific process. So this is some work that um, IBM are pushing around the digital accelerator. Um, so Cleveland um, Hospital and ourselves are the first two of these which are, are signed up effectively, but we're looking to use some of the technologies around deep search, which does literature and pattern searching, um, using um, AI rich sim simulation to, um, to, 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 to screen faster models, and then possibly looking at to synthesize through uh, collaborations with Materials Innovation Factory or some local areas uh, around here to look how we can build that, that application. So this is a piece of work we've actually complete, completed where we looked at organic photovoltaics, where we ingested um, the um, um, so it's, um, 560 um, um, patent literatures looked using um, SMILES data um, to, to, to generate um, similar but not exactly the same models and then use the simulation method to test the theoretical um, conversion rate of that technology into into a into a a, 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 a um, candidate or a candidate list that we could then go and take into uh, synthesis and then accelerate for me is is a pro program that i lead and this is really um how our business case um delivers the economic and social impacts back into the uk it, all these general purpose technologies aren't benefited do, do not receive their full benefits unless they're integrated into the organization in a way that is compelling and delivers better products faster and cheaper so this list this takes off where the um where the explore program um 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 finished and really what we're doing is looking to make the model more robust develop the application integrate it and package it probably within um either openshift or kubernetes to be deployed in a cloud environment and at that point, we would look to license that technology to the company for use within their business um, in a way that they can then take that um, technology forward um, in, in, a, in a way that, that, that delivers um, um, impact. And then finally, just as a, as a, as to complete the picture, we have, we have committed to do 20 emerging technology projects, particularly looking at the application of quantum computing in industrial space. So looking at the areas around um, optimization, logistics and um, 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 pharmaceutical or, or drug screening has been an area we've, we've, we've had um, 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 some interest and engagement at, at the moment. We've, we've just started two or three of these um, pieces of work and um, we're, we're, we're seeing some, some interesting areas, but just to place it on that TRL level, obviously quantum computing is, is, is further back in its maturity, but is, has interesting applications. And at that point, I will hand back to Vassal. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm I'm responsible for the research uh, strategy and general, generally pushing the research agenda at Hartree. So uh, this is our uh, research framework, uh, as you can see, uh, and it's in, in anchored in AI, HPC, data science, and emerging uh, computing paradigms. I mean, quantum computing, neuromorphic computing, 
Uh, then on that, uh, we built uh, data-centric research methods. Uh, we built uh, scalable mathematics approaches, methods and algorithms, uh, all these to tackle the challenges we have. And then we apply advanced research engineering methods to, to program those, advance those, and, and visualize uh, whatever needed. So we have all, all this expertise, we develop it further, and uh, the focus is on, as Michael already outlined, um, HPC and AI enhanced data analysis, HPC and AI uh, enhanced modeling simulations that support um, decision support, and uh, all these placed in uh, hybrid computing and computing continuum framework, meaning everything from sensors to, to the Internet of Things through cloud uh, and to HPC machines, and fundamentals of exascale computing and scalable AI, all these developments, that, how they can underpin uh, the research. Uh, the research aim is to spearhead the developments, uh, look at uh, and develop these advanced methods, and then we can apply those to uh, diverse applications. So, <clears throat> the applications are uh, in the outer ring. Uh, on the picture, uh, we're talking about uh, health, well being, and life sciences. We're talking about uh, environmental modeling, energy efficiency. Uh, smart regions, uh, uh, chemistry materials, uh, all industry 4.0 uh, developments that are linked to uh, manufacturing, uh, aerospace, uh, and digital twinning, and obviously uh, all the fundamentals that enable scientific research. So this allows us to make advances uh, in science, but also with these advances actually to support uh, uh, public sector and industry. Uh, <clears throat> we have a variety of activities uh, in terms of outreach, uh, training, uh, dissemination, and uh, also partnerships uh, and links with businesses, while Michael outlined uh, in, in uh, extend uh, the links with industry. We also work uh, with the public sector. Example of that is uh, UK AEA, which is UK Atomic Energy Authority. So we have a long-term uh, collaboration until 2027 that is focused on fusion, and I'll outline some details there. Uh, we also work, uh, we have partnership with SEC, which is um, a conglomerate uh, uh, and business that is focused on in the area of transport, uh, healthcare. They have several hospitals. They own four airports, and and we're developing uh, this partnership. So, uh, as a center, we have a sectorial approach, and I'll mention uh, that, which is led by our business development, uh, and we have uh, seven staff that come from our innovate department and they embedded with hard recent, within hard research center that works work with us to advance um, work with businesses uh, in terms of platforms uh, our supercomputer is a 4.3 petaflop machine it's already uh, quite aging and we are planning to replace that with uh, uh, with a new one in a couple of years time we have a variety of smaller machines. We have also, we're hosting uh, Jade 2, which is an uh, uh, accelerator based machine uh, for Oxford University. In terms of quantum computing, we have um, Atos Quantum Learning Machine Simulator. We have a variety of cloud computing platforms, and we have uh, um, Visualization Computing Suite, which is uh, half of our ground floor. So, all these facilities allow us to work efficiently with academia, uh, industry, and public sector. I mentioned the uh, thematic application areas that are linked uh, with um, uh, our, our government innovation strategy, and uh, we have a sectorial uh, based approach, which is uh, underpinned by the skills uh, we have. And the main focus is in, in six areas that are linked with the research we do. 
uh, materials, transport, health, well-being, and life sciences, and um, environment, energy, smart regions, industry 4.0, uh, process engineering. I'll, I'll not go in detail, uh, but just to, to outline uh, this. My focus will be, uh, and this uh, uh, talk uh, on exascale computing, and I will go, we'll do three deep dives uh, with aiming uh, these three deep dives to convert in uh, detailed talks if you have interest in the next sessions uh, with you. Um, so, in terms of exascale computing, we work with uh, partnership with uh, ECP project in USA, uh, the Cote and Co. And um, uh, we have seven areas in more detailed uh, collaboration. Um, in terms of uh, fusion, as I said, we had we have five year collaboration with UKAEA uh, uh, that is focused on fusion modeling and simulation uh, at scale. Uh, we also collaborate with Met Office in the area of UK Met Office in the area of performance portability and uh, with our own exascale computing program in UK, which is called Excalibur, uh, that is funded by EPSRC. So we have several initiatives and one of them is Excalibur. Uh, just to go slightly in more detail uh, concerning the collaboration with UKAEA, um, this is a one slide that outlines um, uh, the exascale challenges um, <clears throat> that needs complex modeling of physics, for example, in the plasma exhaust, that needs <clears throat> applying um, stress strain simulation at scale, uh, that needs uh, various uh, UQ strategies in terms of simulation, as, as well as deploying emulators to speed up uh, the computation and uh, dealing with uh, different uh, vast amounts of data that come out and, and processing this, uh, this data. Um, the collaboration is mm, uh, uh, structured in five work streams. Uh, digital threads for fusion facilities, including visualization that looks at various work workflows linked to the data we need to process and how to visualize that. Uh, then the other two are linked more to um, uh, using AI uh, in the simulation, uh, fast actionable emulation at exascale, and AI for uh, plasma control and optimization. Then the fourth one is focused on exploiting uh, a variety of scalable algorithms, uh, including stochastic deterministic one, on different uh, uh, parallel architectures, uh, including AI specific, uh, to try to accelerate the computations and uh, develop novel approaches. And the fifth one is uh, focused on uncertainty quantification approaches uh, for uh, fusion modeling. So these are the, the five areas of interest. And then uh, we'll dive deeper in terms of turbulence flow and using style gun. Johnny, if if you're available, can you just drive us through, please, in detail? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Johnny from the Hearty Center, from part of the High Performance Source Engineering Group. And in this work, basically, what we are trying to do is to um, replace the subgrid scale model that we use in LES with a um, again. A, in particular, StyleGAN, which is a um, generative adversarial network developed by NVIDIA. Um, it has been developed for uh, phase synthesis, and uh, it has the strong properties of allowing uh, um, to change different levels uh, independent from the others. So what's the idea is here, and I don't know if you are familiar with GANs, but basically are two neural networks competing to each other, and uh, eventually they achieve a Nash equilibrium where uh, the generator produces images equal to the uh, data set uh, of reference, where a discriminator is not able to distinguish anymore what is real, what is fake. So the generator will have some internal layers, 
um, and these internal layers we can be thought as LES fields. So we can integrate in time these fields using the filtered Navistox equations, and then we can reconstruct the field with the trained GAN. So in this way, we have a, a precise model um, and also, of course, the speed up of the LES compared to the DNS. Um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Russell. So here were some preliminary results. Um, on the top left, you can see the fields U, V, and the vorticity from the DNS. And uh, on the center, you have the fields from the style gun. And then you can see the difference between the, the DNS and the style gun on the last column. Um, overall, the mean square, square error is a 0.006 percentage, and the structural similarity index is 0.993. Uh, this is about 256 times 256, and it took 11 hours to train on uh, one GPU, one volt V100. Um, on the right, there is the Komogorov spectrum, which is uh, basically matching on the, with the Komogorov up to 10 minus 10, which is considered good because uh, the style gun is in flow 32, so we are down to the machine accuracy, really, for, for uh, that value. And the most important properties that we have found is that if we train on a single image, uh, the style gun is very flexible capable to add up to even uh, uh, different images, which uh, uh, is that one on the bottom right. So that one on the top, bottom left is the training one, that one on the bottom right is the inferent one. And the, basically we have um, um, the flexibility of GAN for the same Reynolds allowed to reproduce the same image. Uh, it sounds quite magic, but then looking at it in the details is due to the a strong distortion in the internal layers. So he knows how to shuffle the vortex around so once he knows the vortex. So that's something that now we're trying to use in the next project with um, Fusion, uh, Nuclear Fusion UKIA, Farscape 2, where basically we are now trying to reproduce the Asagawa-Katani problem, uh, which is very similar. And um, we're um, basically with the, the only difference we're now looking at the electrostatic potential vorticity and uh, density of the electric field. That's it very short. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, so this was presented as a poster on the PCP annual meeting and uh, further paper is on the way to, to Smoky Mountain Symposium in Oak Ridge. So let's see. Uh, if I may continue, so with uh, ECP. Uh, so what we we have here, we are looking at hybrid stochastic deterministic methods for uh, uh, linear algebra. This uh, kind of uh, preconditioning with Monte Carlo, and then running uh, uh, iterative uh, standard iterative methods. I'll show you some results uh, uh, at the end. Uh, uh, we also uh, planning to integrate this in the relevant ECP libraries. Uh, we have uh, exploited also integration of the uh, in the ECP technology stack uh, using Cocos programming model. Uh, you see also some results of Cyclone, uh, and it is already available in the Spark uh, package uh, manager. Also, we share. Um, knowledge and best practices with uh, ECP partners. Lately, we are discussing opening with Excellent, which is part of uh, uh, ECP in terms of scalable AI, uh, working on um, uh, working on uh, general inverse problems using Monte Carlo hybrid approaches, uh, and um, also uh, talking about uh, emulators, etc. And this is ongoing work. Uh, in terms of um, uh, using uh, Cocos and using uh, uh, our work on separation of concerns with uh, Met Office, uh, uh, what we have is um, uh, internal representation cyclone that takes the, the Fortran code. Uh, 
uh, and um, uh, transform this to internal representation through our uh, uh, framework. And then at the end, you have a C++ uh, Cocos uh, code uh, that uh, you can run. And uh, as a result, you can see some um, experimental results uh, <coughs> that show uh, <coughs> that the versions uh, we have in some cases are compatible uh, with the versions that uh, don't use uh, Cocos. Uh, and for example, in this case, uh, and uh, in this case, there is slight overhead uh, comparing with um, uh, OpenCL. So this shows the um, validity and it shows the advantages of using uh, this approach. And we are planning to, to apply the same uh, techniques and the same approaches uh, in terms of separation of concern, translating this knowledge from working uh, with Met Office to the area of fusion, and this is involved in, in this is part of our plan uh, working with UKAA. Uh, in terms of uh, working with Excalibur and uh, applying hybrid uh, methods to tackle um, a variety of matrices, uh, I'll run quickly through a few examples. Uh, these are uh, relatively large, uh, some of them are relatively large matrices um, and symmetric, non-symmetric coming from a variety of uh, applications. First one comes from Lattice QCD. Uh, it's a matrix with complex uh, entries and uh, what this picture shows that with very rough precision our method is not performing well. This is a non-preconditioned one, and this is a preconditioned um, using uh, Monte Carlo and then running conjugate gradients. As you can see, once you start uh, improving the error, uh, you can improve the efficiency of the method, and uh, preconditioned plus conjugate gradients uh, runs faster than non-preconditioned one. Um, this uh, matrix is actually coming from fusion uh, and you can see that uh, uh, having a preconditioned uh, Monte Carlo preconditioned approach combined with uh, GMRS can reduce the time in times. Actually, you can see the difference. This is the non-preconditioned case. This is the preconditioned symmetric and non-symmetric preconditioners. There is small difference also. For some problem depends if you use uh, BCG stop or GMRS uh, at the end. This is the preconditioned case. Uh, this is the non-preconditioned case. So you can see the difference using GMRS in this case, and this is the difference uh, using BCG stop uh, preconditioned and non-preconditioned. So in most of the cases, we um, are able to obtain. Uh, uh, substantial uh, uh, speed up and reduce the number of iterations. Um, so this was the third example, and the area of interest includes uh, performance portability, uh, scalable AI, uh, including sur surrogate modeling, AI for fusion, etc., general inverse problems, separation of concerns, and all these apply to a variety of application areas. So in terms of exascale, we've shown that we can work together with our colleagues in advanced state of the art. Um, we have now established solid collaboration with UKAEA and we can in fusion modeling. We're establishing a center uh, in exascale computing in fusion jointly with UKAEA. They have office now within the Hartree Center and this collaboration involves about uh, over 30 people. On combined on both uh, UKA and Hartree. Uh, we also have in enhanced collaboration with Met Office in the area of performance portability, and we ha uh, have expanding involvement in UK Excalibur program in terms of X scale. So what I wanted to say that uh, uh, we can uh, we can do more detailed talks in these three areas if there is interest and 
we are looking the, uh, to this as opportunities for discussion and uh, collaboration with you. So I can stop here. I had a few more examples, but I think uh, we should give time for some questions. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Michael and Vesel. Um, let's have a Q&A session. And we do have a uh, question from Philip uh, in chat room. Uh, I can read it to you. It's for Michael. How do you find companies to work with? Uh, do you advertise, cold call, at, attend conferences, wait for them to contact you? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so really good question. So, um, we proactively go and find companies and we do that through networking and um, through LinkedIn, through, um, through going to conferences virtually and, and physically uh, and through references. I mean, in, in the 10 years I've been involved in the Hardship Centre, I think we've had two inward bound calls for, for, for projects. So that is quite a rare, a rare event. We, we, we try and maintain <laughs> relationships with, with companies. So, um, for instance, um, with Unilever, we'll have a, a, a monthly meeting with them throughout the year, but we'll also have a, an executive board meeting um, to, 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 to drive um, strategic conversations. Um, but yeah, we, we proactively go and find stuff. I think that's the only way it works, really. And, and also business, develop, business development works both with the scientists and, and Michael and, and the directorate to uh, uh, we started this sectorial approach and talking to, to various bodies in the relevant sector. So we talk to the body that actually has a lot of companies involved and, and is much easier than, than talking individually to companies. And this is to, to addition, uh, in, in, uh, to established already key accounts like Unilever, Rolls Royce, et cetera. So this is quite helping us to, to attract, I'll say more companies. And businesses and, and what, once you've got a bit of a momentum and a track record then it looks less risky i think to organizations if you've delivered a number of projects so so you do get a bit of momentum in that space i think but it, yeah it, i think what i'd say is it is proactively going out taking responsibility go and find people with interesting problems and i find that people in industry have really interesting problems it's just finding the right person with the budget very good, very good. Um, is there any other questions? One of the application area was the transport. Um, you know, Basil mentioned um, what you know. Yes, an uh, air taxi is is considered air. We're looking at logistics. Uh and um, using uh, advanced computational approaches for, for, for those. Uh, lately, we're looking at the supply chain and, and all those things and problems that arise there. Uh, uncertainties in the supply chain. Yes, the these are the areas we are, we are kind of very much interesting, interested. All right, okay, sounds good. All right, uh, there is a question from Wayne following Michael's answer on finding companies, how do you convince them of ROI to get them to commit funding? Yeah, okay. so, so, um, th th yeah. So the, the interesting thing about research is it's quite risky, isn't it? So, so, so there's upside and downside. There. If, if you don't successfully find an innovation, um, that, that, that has benefit, then the ROI is negative, but if you have a, if you find something which is good, then the ROI is positive. Um, so I think what we, we tend to do is where we're asking for commercial contracts, we're going directly asking for money. We tend to have a, a, a more robust story around the innovation, how it works with the, with the business. If it's more risky, we'll look at grants or other funding mechanisms to, 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 to make that work. Um, but ROI on, on applied innovation, means that the, you know, it's the three or four really good ones that pay for everything else. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any other questions?
I see that the AI is playing a big role um, even in the Harkey Center right now. Um, you know, one of the examples you gave was the AI assisting law firms, you know, you know simplifying all the uh, documents, uh, et cetera. That's what other applications of AI do you envision uh, that will really benefit um, um, the industry or? So, so, so I, I, I view artificial intelligence. If you come across this term of general purpose technology, is that something that's spoken about in the, in the States? So this is a really interesting concept. Uh, it's by a Canadian economist, a chap called Richard Lipsy. And he wrote this, this book that said that, that, you know, um, there are, um, only 26 technologies from the dawn of time that significantly move all sectors and all nations and those are you know some of them are obvious like the wheel writing some of them are less obvious like the three masted sailing ship um but one thing that he did also say is is that in order to get the benefit of these general purpose technologies you can't buy them off the shelf you have to integrate them into your society organization in in that space and I think artificial intelligence is 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 one of those things that has to be embedded within the organization, the company in a in a meaningful way. And I think we're going to underestimate in the short term its advantage. You know, I think over the long term it's going to be significant. And I think that anything around natural language processing, anything around vision, anything around decision support. Um, will be enhanced by artificial intelligence, but it requires you to embed it into the organization and to feed it with uh, pipelines of data, which are um, suitable for, for, for that system. Um, and I, 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 I don't tend to try and predict the future because generally I'll be wrong. <laughs> I mean, we're experimenting in fusion, we're experimenting in, uh, we're looking into transport, uh, but you have to make it in a way that uh, uh, have clear explainability of the results, uh, clear, have clear verification, and uh, <clears throat> make sure to deal with any bias, uh, or, or be sure what this bias uh, uh, leads to while using AI. And tackle all this, and obviously being, uh, as Michael said, embedded, uh, being hybrid, actually being part of the bigger, bigger picture and bigger method and, big, and bigger algorithm. Great question. Too hard to answer. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot of a lot of hype. A lot of hype, but I mean it's. This yeah, is, this, this there are a lot of things to do. I mean, to have explainable AI is one of them, and yeah. uh, make it make it scalable for really, really large, large yeah. data and large size of model is another. I mean, in Lawrence Livermore, Brian, um, uh, Ben Hansen, he's the one who's trying to make it scalable uh, for the training of the, you know, the the neural net. Um, Maybe he can say something about it, but yeah, those issues and challenges needs to be addressed, uh, you know, to be really useful. Yeah. So, sorry. So, thank you, Young So, uh, Young So, Young Su. Um, uh, this is Brian. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed a little bit of the conversation, but you know, I think that. It's really important for for our national resources, our, our national labs, Hartree and, and the DOE complex to invest in the ability to train these models at scales that you don't normally see, um, particularly for scientific applications, because, you know, we have, you know, as, as a colleague of mine, Barry Chen once said, you know, we have a massive data and we are we are data rich and, and label poor. And so unsupervised methods that allow us to, to work at scales where we can use all the data that we're finding is, is really important. And um, the ability to take care, you know, take advantage of the leadership class computing that we, we developed in national labs is, is particularly important as well. So, um, you know, actually I, I've met a number of you from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hartree, I think, is it Michael Hay? 
um, a, a couple of years ago. He, Tony Hay, effectively, yes. Tony Hay, yes, thank you. He came out and visited, um, you know, ECP a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, and we actually I was supposed to go to visit you guys the, the week after the shutdown occurred in the U.S. Yeah. to talk about collaborative opportunities. Um, sorry, I, I think I'm rambling on now, but... <laughs> I'll pause for a moment. The, the unreasonable demands of big science is is a good opportunity to build these applications, I think, Brian. And then how do we translate them into use within wider society and the economy is 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 a really interesting problem. A absolutely. And and the ability to sort of have an understanding of what went into these data sets and beca because you know, you think about all the all the fair principles. Um, and, and also just the training methods, you know, if we're deploying these for societal needs um, outside of commercial or beyond commercial interests, yeah. it's, it's really important for us to sort of have a handle on, on you know, how the science goes together uh, to be able to, to hold ourselves accountable to a, to a higher standard. Yeah. It's that, it's that, it's that, it's that um, yeah, that rigor that science often demands. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. I hope this uh, webinar series it will uh, become a good uh, revenue. Um, you know, uh, for the this uh, good discussions and also also uh, eventually we want uh, industrial collaborations and I hope this will be a um, good venue um, and hope many uh, industrial experts. External people can join us and then um, reach out to us, both Hartree and the Lawrence Gable One Chamber. Is there any other uh, questions from audiences? We actually passed the four minutes. Well, if not, let's thank our uh, wonderful two speakers from Hartree Center. Uh, Michael thank, thank you, Vasil. Thank you, Michael. Guys, do you want to stay for a few minutes to just see what we do, uh, next talks, etc., or you have another meeting? Oh, we can stay. Yeah, if you if you have time. So, Vasil, you wanna uh, share <clears throat> some more presentation? Yes. No, no. I, I just wanted to talk to you what what we can do in the next when when you schedule the next talks and what kind of. Talks. Oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Let's do that. Okay, let me stop recording. Yeah. Michael, do you have?